Hello, welcome again to our webinar on democracy and its current transformations. Thank you very much for being there and for following all our lectures. Today we are going to have a, a shift of perspective. Now we're going to deal with one of the, of the main subjects, I think, regarding, um, not the crisis, but the situation of democracy in, uh, in most of, in most of uh, liberal democratic countries. It has to do, of course, with tolerance. And uh, um, we would like to, to analyze it from, um, from a philosophical perspective, not from a strictly politological perspective. And in order to do that, we have invited um, Carlos Thibault, who is a philosophy professor at the uh, Carlos III University in Madrid. He's one of the most famous Spanish philosopher, philosophers, and he's been dealing, of course, not just with, with the main topics of philosophy, but also with authors which somehow we can consider both belonging to the classical philosophical tradition and also um, political philosophical tradition, like um, uh, authors such as uh, John Rawls or, or Charles Taylor or, of course, uh, Jürgen Habermas. So uh, I, I, I can say that Carlos is one of the one of the, our greatest experts in, in those theories. And of course, he's also been, he was one of the first in Spain to deal with, with the liberal communitarian debate, and he has a very good book on that, an extraordinary book, I should say. And so today he is going to speak about new reactive intolerance. And before I'm, I give him the floor, I would like to underline one thing. Um, today is our last lecture and uh, I want to remind you that it's being organized by the Institución Libre de Enseñanza and this is an institution which has always had, you know, at, as one of its main, uh, main goals to try to foster tolerance as one of the key virtues in any democratic society. In that sense, our webpage um, um, tolerance and democracy uh, somehow reflects somehow reflects our very last aim organizing uh, organizing um, seminars like this. Okay, Carlos, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you, Fernando. I wish to start thanking the uh, Fundación Giner and the Institución Jose Garcia Velasco, its president, and, and Fernando for. All organizing this uh, uh, fascinating uh, webinar. Uh, I've learned a lot, I always learn a lot from political scientists. They are scientists, they know the minor issues that define reality. And when, and when one is uh, in the abstraction, as we philosophers tend to be, uh, uh, it's a refreshing uh, air to breathe uh, facts and to breathe uh, close down to earth realities. Well, I, I'd like to present a very short uh, uh, reflection on uh, tolerance and intolerance. And I'll divide my, my, my presentation in three main areas. First, uh, first uh, uh, an approach to what tolerance and toleration and, and, and intolerance are. Then I'll move to an analysis of uh, what I term uh, new reactive intolerances, but peculiarly, I mean, uh, many of the things we've been talking about in the seminar this, these past weeks. And then I'll end with a short uh, reflection on what's at stake in uh, this uh, predicament of the new intolerance and uh, what's at stake for democracy. Uh, in facing the problems we are facing. So uh, let's start with a very wide description of uh, what uh, intolerance and tolerance uh, uh, may be. Uh, we tend to think of toleration as uh, a practical and uh, 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 concrete set of institutions and rights that allows for the peaceful civil coexistence of uh, citizens who do not share their beliefs, paramatly their religious beliefs in, in the history of our societies. In, democ in democratic societies, uh, 
individual rights, such as the freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, the freedom of, of association, could thus be thought as an enactment of uh, a, a tolerant society. This is the uh, everyday understanding of what tolerance is. And reversely, we uh, think of intolerance, a practice and a reality this country knows a lot of, and this institution knows, uh, knows a lot about. We tend to think of intolerance as uh, a refusal or denial, a repression of such uh, differences of, in beliefs, practices, and identity that we normally deem now to make up or constitute a pluralistic society. Well, but under this clear everyday broad understanding of what toleration and intolerance are, lies a complex, uh, unsolved, and maybe sometimes unsolvable set of problems that tend to make toleration an almost unsolvable conundrum, a puzzle. When and why should we tolerate what we deeply disagree with? What are the limits of toleration? Are there not beliefs and attitudes with which we not only disagree, but also morally disagree in terms even of disgust? and that constitute a challenge, a political and a moral challenge for social peace, and, we, and, uh, and, what, and, and which we, th we think should not be tolerated. But deeper still, who is this we? I'm talking about the tolerates and questions itself, about the reasons and the limits of toleration. Or, to put it even more starkly and conversely, how would it look like if we shift our point of view and think in the shoes of she who demands to be tolerated, her, dif her differences and disagreements with the us setting a claim to acknowledgement and recognition? All these questions and, and much more may explain why I have just termed toleration an almost impossible conundrum. You can only think about what can be tolerated in contextual cases. You can only think about what can be and should be tolerated in historical contexts. But the structure itself of toleration seems uh, puzzling. It is a puzzle how, of how uh, uh, to live together, not only in spite of our differences and disagreements, but in the midst of our differences and disagreements. It's not putting aside disagreements, it's living together in the midst of disagreement. And I would suggest that the riddle, the conundrum of toleration, is that of an unfinished and even an unfinishable complex learning process that comes way back from early modernity and it's still ongoing. It not only involves uh, cognitive dimensions as the reasons we may have for disagreeing and the reasons we may strike for bracketing our own disagreements, but also has emotional components how is it possible to tolerate something that morally disgusts us? Disgust is an emotional term. And because the process, the learning process of toleration is cognitive or epistemic, if you want, and it is also emotional, it's a cognitive and emotional achievement. And to uh, toleration would thus be a holistic process that involves personal and attitudinal dimensions, but also uh, institutional implementations through which a type of social identity is forged or built or constructed. Well, even in our spontaneous everyday understanding 
of what is toleration, there seems to be different levels and different moments of toleration. And maybe it could be interesting just to deal for a moment on an, an, an ideal, and I under, underline this, it's an ideal, conceptually ideal reconstruction of the process of le the learning process of toleration I was talking about. In the first moment, we could say, in moment zero, we have uh, an attitude of conflict and repression or annihilation of those who are not deemed to be the same as us, those who are not tolerated. And that moment zero easily turns, or has not easily, difficultly has turned, but turns into a first moment of moral toleration as uh, accepting the coexistence of those behaviors and beliefs to which there is a strong disagreement. This is a episodic notion of toleration. Let it go, let it pass. Let's not quarrel about this at this moment, at this point. Probably a starker, denser moment of toleration, the movement of toleration, comes when uh, uh, negative toleration is, is established as, is itself as uh, putting up well, with uh, the positive tolerance of respect uh, within a normative framework of rights, opening up the space for the coexistence of different people under laws accepted by all. This is a stable institutional notion of toleration that's tied to individual rights, to the separation of church and state, and creates a normative framework in which different uh, 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 behaviors, beliefs, identities are able to, co to coexist under, I insist, the uh, uh, shared understanding of the rule of law. And this, even in spite of the depth and uh, uh, of disagreements that may exist in that society. The, the, there might be a third moment, and Rainer Horst, for example, has insisted on that, or in, in, which, uh, a, a pop, in which a new type of positive tolerance appears in the recognition of value pluralism, uh, the pluralism the value of pluralism of values and way of, ways of life, uh, in which uh, mm, some previously not tolerated or even barely tolerated uh, 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 behaviors and understandings and beliefs uh, are now thought of as, as worthy of, of steam. I can steam something and appreciate something I, I do not share, but I, I, I steam it's being there, it's being part and parcel of the society I live in. It, it, it is, is that a movement, what I'm trying to depict, ideal, ideally reconstructed movement, uh, in its different gradations, and the image and the evaluation of the tolerated person changes from contempt in the first zero moment to appreciation, and uh, it's uh, 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 the movement of appreciation to esteem. Well, this uh, idealized uh, uh, theoretical uh, model of toleration uh, uh, is full of problems in its reality, in its historical reality. Uh, as I said before, toleration is always contextual, and and, and, and it's difficult to establish a general theory of that. On the contrary, uh, intolerance is either, on the one hand, the refusal to enter in such a learning process, a resistance to cope with the burden of accepting the live and cooperate with, with she who is different, or it can be intolerance, the giving up, the refusal, the relinquishing of that very learning process itself. 
and the return to a previous situation, a statu quo ante, of sheer disagreement and conflict. Well, this second version of uh, intolerance, a failure or an interruption of an open learning process, is what I would be calling reactive intolerance. And it is, in my view, what is increasingly appearing and problematizing uh, uh, our societies. There's a second relevant trait of contemporary intolerance, and it is a shift of emphasis. To put it in a nutshell, it is a shift from beliefs to bodies, from religion to social identities. Let me explain that. If in early modernity, in the wake of the Reformation, the failure or the cost of repressive policies and wars of religion opened the political and social field to the coexistence of different religions and to the freedom of conscience and, 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 so, and religious practice, and thus gave rise to the first modern formulations of negative tolerance, in our times, uh, a wider range of beliefs, attitudes, and problems are the battlefields of toleration. Perhaps yeah, the metaphor of battlefields is not adequate, but it's a problematic place of toleration. In our time, the fields of realities that call for a symmetrical, open-mindedness has expanded beyond religion and the realm of the mind and the soul. Intolerance now seems to take on the facts of racism, patriarchal contempt for women, homophobia, and xenophobia, for example. There is a widening of the field in which intolerance present, presents itself today. The system of today's intolerances can be seen as making different and more radical normative demands than those that, had be, that, that began to be formulated in the early modernity, because it questions not only the freedom of the minds, but also the injustice towards the bodies. For example, in the denial of symmetry or of equal treatment, of adequate recognition of different sexual, racial, ethnic identities. And it's interesting that if we, if we, if we, if we look back to our history and uh, uh, from these uh, current uh, cultural discussions, we find that old racial and colonial intolerances of which our country has been an expert can be read back with new eyes and seen form as even uh, necropolitics, avant la lettre of extermination and uh, uh, related to these uh, field of the bodies and sensibilities I was talking of. Certainly, the, the, the conflicts in, in which contemporary intolerance appear and in which they are resisted do not operate outside the exercise of the classic freedoms of conscience, expressions, and assembly. And there are even protests use uh, uh, these uh, freedoms in the, moment, in the movement of resistance to contemporary rising intolerance. So it's not that we have shifted from mind to body, it's that freedoms and liberties are now seen as being also embodied. In spite of this, a third trait of uh, contemporary reactive intolerances is that they appear as the emergence of new political of and cultural agenda that challenge the emergency, the emergence of, uh, of up to now unseen, hidden, or minimized 
problems, such as, for example, the violence against women, against the African-American community in the US, against non-heterosexual patriarchal identities all throughout the Western world, against she who is different because of her ethnic origins also throughout the Western world. But specifically, uh, and it, as uh, uh, um, Marta Freile mentioned the other day, there is a, a, a special type of backlash because uh, contemporary reactive intolerance questions not only uh, Mm, the identities, the bodies, the practices, the attitudes of these uh, different people, but also questions the very democratic understandings and institutions that are deemed to be responsible, you know, deemed from their point of view, for these new insurgencies. For example, the protection of individual rights that have allowed for the expression of violence uh, against women in the private and the public spheres, or the public expression of different gender identities, and the case, for example, of uh, uh, homosexual marriage uh, uh, is a good case in point, because now uh, reactive intolerance would think that the very system that allowed for that type of uh, marriage to happen should be questioned. So this is the, the portrait, let's say, of a, a, a new reactive intolerance. And what is the driving force? What, what is the mechanism that drives these forms of intolerance? I would suggest that it relates not only to the unstable, always circumstantial exercises of reasoning, the reasons for disagreement and the reasons for bracketing our disagreements that have left, that have led to an institutional frame of uh, the civil coexistence and cooperation in a, an already inescapable structural pluralism, for example, in terms of constitutional protection and individual rights, but also to the system of political identities and exercises of power that have underlain the very exercise of pluralistic society and its institutions. As it has been increasingly visible, for example, in the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, universal civic wo voting rights were tolerated as long as they did not question the white majority hegemony in that community. Or as long as the social peace in this community is not challenged when relevant data concerning the differential exercise of law enforcement come to the fore from the point of view of law enforcement there seems to be no equ equality and fairness of treatment. In this case, is the very question is the very question of a challenged white hegemony identity that drives the reactive intolerant uh, uh, response. Likewise, uh, uh, visualizing, putting in this public space the hidden mechanisms of inequality and violence that women suffer in our societies questions the deeper patriarchal roots of hegemonic social identities. The Me Too movement, or the, the Ni Una Menos movement in Latin America, become public challenges to these identities and, and elicits a defensive uh, response of protection of the privilege, privileges upon which a male-dominated society is articulated. If you question those privileges, then, and then those were hidden uh, privileges, uh, not made public or not acknowledged publicly as privileges, then a reactive moment, movement, uh, 
reactive uh, uh, intolerance may be elicited. The point I'm making is that toleration has not been, when it has been, a learning process in a disembodied, abstract realm of reasons why we tolerate, why it became reasonable to create a system that not only acknowledges differences, for example, in the realms of beliefs. Rather, toleration has always been a learning process concerning social identities that have been fraught, that have been charged with power and power positions. And I would say that the challenge that the new reactive intolerant places would, be, would not be in my mind to give up the demands of reason and public reasoning, but to be aware that the problems that we are dealing with and that we are strongly, and that can strongly destabilize contemporary societies need a wider frame to be understood. And above all, a new exercise of public reasoning that can incorporate the very realities to, the, to which the new and perhaps not so new intolerance react to. And there is an added relevant risk in contemporary intolerances. Not only it is the backlash of reactive intolerance I've been talking about, but the symmetrical, aggressive response to this intolerance in social movements themselves. It seems that reaction fosters reaction, and we can become enmeshed in a whirlwind that destabilizes and threatens deep social institutions. For example, think about the monument quarrels in uh, not only the US, but also in Europe. Such a response, such a reactive response to reactive intolerance uh, tenses the social cultural space and threatens the possibility of imagining a new, more inclusive in public reasons that might that might allow the political coexistence of the different and the disagreeing. I'm not suggesting at all that resisting contemporary intolerance uh, should be taken out, out of the democratic agendas. I think it should be present. What I'm suggesting, rather, is that we need to focus more on the new construction of a now much needed public reasons in different ways of enacting public reasoning. We need to enlarge the scope of public reasoning. Toleration, I suggested earlier, is a complex structure of social learning. The reasons we may have for disagreement in a pluralistic society not only relate to arguments, to the force of the better argument, to put it in Habermasian terms, but also to social uh, and identity positions. And in the same way that in earlier times, the reasons that were given to bracket state, uh, stated motives of disagreement implied a new understanding of the positions as identities of the power holders. Think, for example, of the reasons the uh, French sovereign could have for the Edict of Nantes. Uh, um, and uh, later on, uh, moving from the sovereign as the king to the us as the sovereign personally, uh, uh, politically constituted in a, in, a, in, a, in a democratic society, perhaps also new shifts are needed. And Perhaps a new us needs to be thought with different concepts. We need new tools to face our current predicament, the new uh, unavoidable condition, the new unavoidable human condition humaine, to put it in uh, Montaigne's terms. So let me move to the uh, 
third and final part of my, my talk. What is the stake in, in this process? And why, in spite of the failures that uh, menace the learning process of toleration, uh, um, in spite of these failures, uh, we need to continue the exercise of tolerance. But specifically, I, I, I would suggest, and I am aware that this may be too abstract, but I'm a philosopher. The types of things that are relevant to this new understanding of the us that need to be reframed. Vis-a-vis -vis the general understanding of personal and social agents, subjectivities, uh, subjectivities and identities that focus on the power of human agency as the individual powers uh, and attitudes I think two traits uh, uh, of the human condition and of modern subjectivity seem to be coming to the fore. First is the re relational uh, character of agency or subjectivity or identity. Second, it's vulnerability. These two traits have both been clearly underlined in our current global crisis, climate change, and in close times, the pandemia. The dependency on nature and the mutual dependency of human subjects are the new perspective, the new gaze, that seems to be now unavoidable. Interestingly enough, these two traits, almost spiritual or conceptual traits in spite of the sheer materiality, is something that contemporary reactive intolerance uh, oppose and despise. And in these two cases, dependency of nature and mutual dependency of human beings, the place of reasons is highly relevant for articulating social positions in facing new and inescapable realities. We have stern and stubborn scientific reasons to understand, to unavoidably understand the dependency of our species on the natural realm of, the, of nature. Equally, we have stern, stern and stubborn scientific, but also moral and political reasons to acknowledge the relational nature of human beings and societies. As I see it, I perceive an ongoing, open, continuous discussion that musters these two dependencies together and that in the terrain uh, I have been talking about this evening faces a clear opposition from the side of the new reactive intolerance movement. To put it in a nutshell, these movements, of which populism has been the rep repeated uh, example or token in our webinar these weeks, these new movements are in opposition to science and fight against solidarity. Fallible as science should be and fragile as solidarity can be. And let me finish with an even more general philosophical note, uh, uh, even more you may wonder. Our generalized uh, post-Machiavellian understanding of politics, but even of morality, has as it core, as it, at, at its core the question of who benefits from actions. It is not only a hermeneutical tool for understanding guilt and wrongdoings in penal law, it is a deeper way of thinking about human actions in terms of personal, individual, benefits. The penal question of who protest, who benefits, applies beyond uh, our judicial practices and seems to have permeated all assessments of responsibility and action in different fields. The double trait of natural dependency and of shared vulnerability suggests a different motive 
a different question, not who, who, who benefits, who brothers, but who suffers, who is patitur, who suffers. This change, this shift, moves us away from a conception of power and omnipotence to a conception of responsibility and even urgency. Who is suffering now? How? Why? What can be done about it? Interestingly enough, and in a closing return to the conundrum of toleration I mentioned at the beginning, maybe tolerance is one of the first moments in modernity in which the perception of suffering, the perception of quis patitur, of harm, can be read back as an unconscious clue to its emergence. Toleration was not only the best strategy for the maintenance of power of the sovereign, as we know it was. Perhaps it was also the acknowledgement of the sheer intolerability of violence as a mechanism for solving social problems. And perhaps this what is what was emblematically performed and enacted in the Edict of Nantes. Perhaps I'm reading, I'm reading too much in, in, into history. But, but the avoidance of uh, violence as a mechanism for social actions and institutions, sometimes widely held in the meliorist uh, understanding of democracy we have been sharing, is part and parcel of this growing learning process in which, we all hope, reactive intolerance is just only a menacing hindrance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, I think it was uh, um, an excellent, an excellent lectures, lecture on, on an, an incredibly difficult topic because it has so many nuances you know, all around. Okay, to start with the, uh, with the dialogue, um, well, I have perhaps too many questions. Uh, I'll start with one which has to do with the concept of intolerance and how it has been shifting these last days, as you have just um, underlined. And it is the question of tolerance and indifference, right? So, you know, as in order for that to be the need for tolerance, we don't have to be indifferent to a certain practice huh, regarding a certain, certain uh, uh, thoughts or certain... Um, certain moral moral issues uh, on part of of groups of of people belonging to our own society but as how, so tolerant tolerance can only come into being uh, not liking the other but nevertheless accepting the other right recognizing that that other has a right for respect so it's really incompatible with indifference. But we, what we are observing now is that uh, we have shifted from an absolutely indifferent society, so no one cared, you know, this postmodern society, so uh, anyone can really think whatever he or she thinks fit, can do whatever they, they believe they should be doing. We have shifted into what you have called reactive intolerance, right? So somehow we have, we have pushed the limits of the intolerable far higher than they used to be, right? And don't you think this has to do with, um, with uh, the moralization of political and social conflicts? Because... Remoralization. More, or remoralization of social conflicts because... Uh, once that uh, uh, religion has been privatized, well, we haven't seen, we haven't really uh, been subject to, to strong religious conflicts, right? So uh, new conflicts tend to appear, as, as you just have said, regarding identities or the lack of recognition of identities. So somehow, this non-recognition of what we morally believe 
ought to be recognized leads to uh, an intolerance regarding you know most of the of the uh, of the main current social practices right so so it's uh, it's a reaction, in the end, it's a reaction against indifference. So different people ought to be respected as being different. And not, not uh, taking any account on the needs, on their, um, as you said, vulnerability, somehow is also, you know, implies the breakdown of a right, you know, that these people have. So somehow I think moralization of politics, polarization, together with perhaps the, the absolute disappearance of ideological politics has led to a conflict where, um, where struggle regarding identities, struggle regarding, regarding the, uh, uh, the appearance of new uh, social ills, huh? of, of which we haven't been so conscious, you know, uh, uh, prior to this time, probably. Hmm? I think here the, the, uh, the crisis of 2008, I think, was, was a wake-up call somehow. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I think it has, it has a lot to do with, um, it has a lot to do with, uh, with, with a, an accusation vis-a-vis -vis the classical conception of tolerance that in the end, Tolerance was a disguise through which we have become indifferent to social, to certain social ills, right? So, um, so, so it's not, it's not really intolerance. You know what's at stake? I think what's at stake is really the criticism of a certain liberal principles that were um, considered to be, you know, procedural, so to say, in order for you know, for society to self-organize, but uh, in the end um, were um, perfectly functional in order to, um, to keep the system working. So, and, and, and that somehow we needed um, a counter force you know, in order to show ordinary citizens what's at stake during the main social conflicts. So, you know, because conflicts disappeared under this, okay, you know, Indifference, you know, as I was saying. So um, I don't know if I made myself clear because, as I said before, this is la, this is uh, this is really the key point. You know, the key point is when. Um, so um, the question is, why now, right? So why has this new intolerance appeared nowadays, right? And, and so it must have to do something with the context, and I think the context is of. Uh, of a frivolous public culture, disappearance of ideological, ideological worldviews, um, individualism, and a return to uh, identity politics. So maybe, maybe those are some keystones through which we we can we can have a we can have a glimpse of what's. Uh, of what's at stake here. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Uh, and I uh, mm, appreciate, I mean, as I said before, the uh, descriptive power that uh, you social scientists have, although you're a political scientist also, uh, a the theorist also. Um, mm, I, 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 I can't risk uh, uh, a diagnosis of why now. No? I, I, I would suggest a couple of, uh, of traits that are also relevant. You know? uh, I think uh, that the uh, liberal predicament, the liberal understanding, the liberal uh, self-consciousness uh, of uh, uh, democratic societies is facing severe limits and uh, probably uh, the growing inequality and the intersectional nature of uh, growing inequality that women, gender, that race and origin uh, intersect to create a, a new uh, depressed uh, 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 class, uh, 
group or whatever in society. Uh, uh, I, mean, I think that, that is very relevant. You know? But what's interesting is also that uh, this new predicament uh, shows uh, that some things were hidden. We did not talk about uh, the uh, practical uh, disenfranchisement of votes in the, in the, in the, in, in, in the African-American community. Uh, we did not talk about, of course, uh, uh, violence against women. I mean, the, that is a, a global pandemic. It's a disaster. Uh, that as, as we uh, have more data concerning it, it is really uh, terrorizing. We did not talk about uh, uh, homophobia, uh, and uh, till the new in, uh, 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 migration waves started to strike both the uh, the, the, the American uh, border and Europe, uh, we did not talk to talk about xenophobia. It was there. It was there in Germany. It was there in in the U.S. It was there in even in Spain, uh, but this was not talked about. And so the, 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 the bringing to the fore of these questions both uh, uh, empowers the, the, the protest and empowers at the same time the consciousness of the, law, the loss of privileges. And uh, I mean, social phenomena always have double face, no? And uh, probably that was that was the case. So, so you said um, uh, uh, indifference. It was there. It was there because it, we didn't talk about. And the making explicit of deep social fractures and deep social harms uh, is what peculiarly creates both an over to resistance to those fractures and a defensive reaction to our understanding of those social fractures. Well, this, this only adds to, to your analysis, which I, 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 I think I agree with. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, Javier, if you want to, to put a question or, or to read some of the questions uh, on part of the public, <clears throat> please. Hello. Um, yes, I th uh, there is a question from Carlos Gonzalez Sancho that I think that is quite relevant and quite connected to what we are talking about. Um, he says that, um, well, first of all, uh, he thanks you, Carlos, for, for your reflections. And, and he says, I noticed the emphasis you put on the, on the concept of visibility. It seems that uh, reactive intolerance reacts to something mainly when it becomes visible, rather that, 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 than to something that comes into existence. Or put uh, differently, uh, it reacts to something that comes into existence publicly in the social space. Um, the third toleration moment is then maybe mainly about accepting or embracing a new identities landscape uh, of uh, identity positions that by becoming visible, uh, become fully legitimate. Um, and, and he says that he's thinking more about sexual identities or images of empowerment. By contrast, if I am not too misguided, Carlos says, maybe the first and the second toleration moments are facilitated by lesser visibility. So the others are tolerated as longer as they are not seen in everyday situations. Um, and Carlos asked if you can please elaborate on this point or this connection uh, between visibility, relevance, and, and tolerance. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure that in classic negative tolerance, conflicts were invisible. I mean, wars of religion were... were really visible and, uh, and they were devastating for uh, uh, not only in France, for the whole of Europe. Uh, uh, Europe House was divided for a long time in many centuries and a division that still 
uh, draw so on. So there was, there was visibility. The thing is, what things were not visible and what things are now visible? I, I made a suggestion that maybe now it's not the problem of uh, the liberties of the mind, like religious beliefs, but also political beliefs, but, 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 but the justice of the bodies. And that's why I focused on, 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 on gender, race, and origin, let's say. You know? so th those things were not only uh, 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 invisible, <laughs> they were irrelevant in terms of the social construction of uh, uh, identities and institutions. Uh, um, it only starts to be uh, relevant in, 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 in the Enlightenment. No? Uh, um, and what's interesting is that we suddenly realize that it was there all along. When one reads uh, uh, Aristotle, uh, on nat nat natural slavery in the politics, uh, just close by is his uh, uh, reflection on uh, the subordinate place of women. Uh, uh, the slave, the natural slave, lacks uh, bullies, lacks uh, rational will. Uh, women do have uh, rational will, thank goodness, but they lack sovereignty of their will, over their will. So it was there, all, all, all along it was there. But we didn't see what the deprivement of, 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 of political authority uh, about uh, uh, their own lives, uh, 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 women, ha women suffered. So um, some things were seen and some things were not seen. In the classic of model of toleration, said the European uh, lock uh, analysis in the liberal frame uh, uh, is uh, probably the clearest example, and Locke gives wonderful reasons to the sovereign why he should tolerate uh, certain things, not others, by the way. Uh, mm, mm, these uh, new uh, uh, problems uh, were not envisioned. Uh, all forms of uh, reactive intolerance uh, spring from uh, these new uh, uh, accent, uh, uh, these new phenomena of the justice of the bodies. Not really, not only, not only, because as, as I said, reactive intolerance reacts to uh, the uh, system of, uh, of individual rights that protects the appearance of new ways of understanding personal and social identity. So it's sort of a reactive, second grade type of intolerance also. Okay, Javier, um, I think you had a, you had a question? Um, yes, I have a, a question of my own. Um, well, the, the, the political institution of tolerance is, is often described as a process of neutrality or abstention uh, on the part of public powers. Uh, so public powers should avoid imposing any conception of, of the good life. But there is also a, a Republican conception of tolerance, which uh, according to authors such as Antoni Domenech, would not involve neutrality, but active intervention. More specifically, it would require the neutralization of private powers. Um, so for example, the neutralization of the Catholic Church, we could read lens. This, this idea of tolerance is based on, on the assumption that if there is a private power strong enough to impose its private conception of the public good, then peaceful coexistence uh, requires this active intervention to neutralize that power. What, what is your opinion of this conception of tolerance? Do you, do you think that it's, it can be combined with your redefinition, redefinition of, of tolerance? Yeah, thank you, Javier, and, and thank you for bringing in Tony, uh, Tony Domenic, a close friend, uh, with, who we all miss. Yeah, no, I... I I'm close to a certain Republican conception uh, 
in the sense of an active uh, involvement of of a we in the in the in the in the in the opposition to private forms or to uh, uh, aggressive forms of uh, uh, domination. I, I, I deeply agree with that. And I, in, in, in the book that, that, that uh, Fernando mentioned on, on communitarianism I wrote a long time ago, uh, uh, there was precisely the chapter that the, the, the new republicanism was then emerging, uh, probably uh, could be read as uh, 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 a further step in, uh, in, in, in understanding liberal uh, theories and societies uh, beyond the what I thought was the uh, reactive uh, and uh, backward uh, understanding of community of the communitarians in the 80s and in the 90s, you know. And I thought republicanism might be a, a good new field for that. Well, um, well okay, but as long as we uh, keep the acquisitions, the 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 the, uh, uh, um, the vantage points that our liberal democratic tradition has given, uh, I would uh, very much uh, 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 defend uh, individual uh, rights because these are the ones that make possible. Uh, the uh, the reaction itself, the reaction to uh, against the reaction, it, it makes possible the defense of uh, a new uh, political community. Of course, finally, we've moved away from uh, the old establishments of uh, the difference between religion and and state, uh, neutrality. Uh, um, uh, mm, regarding the good or the ways of understanding the good in private lives. But I would say there are some things there that should be kept. Uh, and I think that the idea that we can appreciate uh, our different, our different uh, ways of understanding our lives uh, requires that we can express those very differences and the different notions of the good that are present there. Yeah? Uh, uh, the Republican intuition doesn't, uh, in, my, in my opinion, doesn't pose uh, a, a, a global idea of the good for society. It's not perfectionism in that sense. It's uh, a, a moment of resistance against the uh, forces of prioritization, as you said, and I would say of backslashing, uh, as uh, we have been talking these days. Thank you. Uh, Javier, I think there's another question by Fernando Carreño. Maybe you can, you can read it, please. Uh, yeah, Fernando asks, uh, which are really the really roots of, of, intolerance, of intolerance? Let's say, for example. The, the real roots. The real, yeah, the roots. Of being tolerant. Yeah, he says, let's say, for example, according to the um, Islamic tale, the others are considered as um, ignorant or uninformed, uh, the so-called Yahiliya, I don't, I don't know uh, how to pronounce this word, um, which in turn allow those following those rules to commit whatever they consider. Uh, this, in, this is in turn not far away from the religion-based wars that were developed in Europe some time ago. Not so far if we inspect the telling of those who get the, the, the winning point. So the role of religion should be taken into account just by following the, the, the perceptive words of, of Walter. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I am correctly understood the, the, the question that I'm trying to, to ask. Not why, but... Let me put it this way. Um, I I'm always suspect of the idea of they are not tolerant. Uh, mm, because they are theys that are not tolerant. <laughs> they are theys that are very tolerant, yeah. even in the, in, 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 the, in the Muslim world. Let me change the, the question uh, to a different example. Uh, 
I, I, for a moment, I thought I was going to talk to you about this, but then I thought it was too uh, meshy and <laughs> abstract. I've been reading lately, uh, rereading lately, uh, uh, Adorno's chapters on the authoritarian personality, you know, this uh, set of very debatable uh, uh, the social and psychological analysis that the uh, German uh, exiles uh, uh, studied and wrote about in, in New York in, 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 in the 40s. And uh, I mean, uh, um, rereading uh, Adorno's chapters, uh, it's interesting, it's too Freudian. I mean, there's a lot of things that distance myself, I can distance myself from. But there's an, a, a trait in intolerance, that's the famous F scale, F for fashion scale of personality, that uh, creates, uh, that, that builds up uh, the idea that uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is, was and is one, a form of clear uh, intolerance, uh, is uh, related to certain traits of fixity, of inability to face the new, of rigidity in terms of mental processes, of uh, the necessity of, 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 of categorizing the other, inventing even the other, uh, in order to uh, define oneself. And I think those mechanisms, when I was reading this summer, uh, we were reading this summer, those chapters, uh, and we uh, we had on on the newspapers every day uh, uh, could be reread in in, in in very fruitful terms you know? and and uh, I would invite uh, you or somebody to 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 do that because uh, uh, changing the uh, the the frame the psychological frame uh, changing the uh, uh, context. Uh, uh, one finds the same uh, problem and idea. Reactive intolerance is reactive in the sense that it creates a, a, a block of identity that responds to, one what, to what one sees as a challenge. Why is your identity as even a white male, working class, jobless guy in, uh, in Minnesota uh, uh, feel threatened by the fact that some black woman down in um, Louisiana decides to uh, marry another woman. Well, I mean, why? I mean, wh wh what's, the, what's the nexus between your uh, 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 supremacist understanding of yourself and even taking your guns and doing that? Why, why um, let's put the case in Spain. I mean, change, just change the example. And uh, the, the, the there is something strange in the sort of failure, I said, in learning process, in a personal learning process, but a failure in social learning process of understanding that uh, uh, the right for difference of somebody doesn't mean a minus uh, right uh, for myself in whatever I'm doing. No? That, that's uh, that's a, a real problem. No? And so the roots of tolerations, I would say, is uh, to go back to the question is being able to mind to sustain your own identity while doubting and being skeptical. The first tolerant people were skeptical, I love them. Uh, Montaigne, La Voltee, whatever. Uh, uh, um, uh, doubt about yourself, but anyhow be able to construct your own identity uh, beyond the opposition, the agonistic opposition to the other. I don't know if that's an answer, but uh, that's the way I would go. Okay, Carlos. Um, so considering that this is the last lecture of our webinar, maybe we should also introduce a last question, so which has to do with, with, other, with some of the topics we've been dealing with. So, uh, what do you think are the consequences of this new reactive intolerance for, for democracy? 
because it seems that it has an influence on the right of free speech throughout this new um, cancel culture, for instance, or this, the, the introduction of uh, enormous restrictions regarding um, dealing with certain subjects, as you know, in, the, in American academia, particularly, mm -hmm. there's some subjects that cannot be tackled, yeah. you know, that are excluded for public discussion. So in that sense, it seems that uh, this points towards, towards one of those um, uh, invisible or almost invisible dimensions of liberal democracy that, has, that are being affected um, continuously that may in the end uh, have an effect on on the status, you know, of, of I mean, of the of on, on the real value of democracy as it is practiced nowadays, right? So, because it seems that we have somehow restricted the issues on which we we can publicly discuss, and uh, and you know, one of the predicaments of democracy is precisely that anything that has to do with with a public dimension, with a civic dimension ought to be discussed publicly, right? So, uh, and, and lots, of, lots of questions are being taken out of the agenda of public discussion because they might potentially affect, affect sensitivities or they might affect um, feelings. Uh, going back to this emotional politics we're living now. But on the other hand, what we see is, uh, and the populists are a good example, um, so another part of the of the public that somehow has made uh, has made of the act of of abusing uh, a discourse that runs against you know those very those very goods that we try to somehow to protect and and that are I mean they have they're, they're limitless so on the one hand we have certain political actors that restrict themselves in what they say in, in, in their speech. And on the other hand, there are others that enhance, you know, the, the controversial, uh, controversial speech. I mean, Donald Trump was the perfect example, right? So, so this, this paradox of having leaders, I mean, that don't give a damn about, about restricting their discourse. And on the other hand, we have academia, academic, or journalism, you know, are trying to avoid tackling, you know, issues that might have, that might, uh, that might create a reaction, right? Because they are sensitive to, to certain uh, identity groups. And, and I think, so we have to make a balance out of it. I think, and, and because my, my personal position is that we are restricting one fundamental democratic right, which is free speech. I mean, I don't have time to argue for it, right? So, but... But I think that's, that's what's really at stake with this new wave of, of reactive intolerance, as you have um, presented it. I think I agree with you. I fully agree with you, Fernando. Uh, uh, political correctness has to be seen from the two sides. I mean, it can be seen as, as self-censure, as self-restraint, have self uh, timid, uh, uh, um, I don't know, repression, or it can be seen as the sensi sensitivity uh, towards uh, 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 certain persons, attitudes, uh, etc., which may resent our using certain words, a certain way of talking, etc. No? Uh, I think that it's a problem, but that it's a that is a power because it gives you the upper hand in terms of sensitivity. And uh, uh, I think that this type of sensitivity uh, that relates to the idea of uh, vulnerability and the uh, who suffers that I mentioned, uh, it's a, a strong power. But at the same time, you say, the, the, the populist uh, involvement they open, they speak openly, you know. Well, um, yes, and hurtingly, and, and, uh, and, and one would wish that uh, 
uh, the, the general public uh, would be uh, sensible to the to the to the uh, resentment that these uh, w w uh, discourses convey, and and, and that, that the general public would be sensible to the the hurt, the harm that these uh, type of uh, general um, uh, reactive uh, intolerance discourses inflict. Uh, mm, I think you're right. The crucial point is freedom of expression. But then freedom of expression should perhaps find a third way. There was a classical Catholic motto that read, Suaviter in modo, but fortiter in re. Mm. Do it kindly, but strongly in your positions. You know? Uh, I think that's right. I mean, I think we shouldn't give up the sensibility, the suaviter in modo. Mm. Do it, uh, 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 be inattentive and, sen and, and sensible to what hurts and who is hurt. But fortiter in re. Uh, fortiter in re means strong in your convictions, for example, in the defense of uh, the freedom of expression. Uh, this is very difficult to articulate in a policy or in a, because this is contextual. <laughs> as tolerance is always contextual, and you have to find your way uh, uh, of uh, uh, how to articulate uh, public discourses along those lines, and more importantly, articulate a public discussion so that the voters at the end mm. are able to understand what is at stake. No? Uh, it takes some time, I think, and, and it probably it's just a process of back and forth, no? But uh, sometimes I'm pessimistic, and sometimes I'm more uh, I'm less pessimistic. No, but th that's that's a quarter of democracy itself. But right? that's why tolerance is an open process, always an open process. Yeah, but I guess there are certain pathologies, right? So uh, sure, sure, sure. when um, <clears throat> someone is shut down, I mean, is uh, is. Uh, He's been subject to an enormous criticism simply because she or he has written a book on Mexicans being a, 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 a white American, right? So, I mean, it, it's, it, has, it has a lot of, of inconsistencies and it's really yeah. difficult to accept, right? So in the end, I, I think the, the problem with which I, I started is really the problem with, uh, well, it, it, that's at least my, <laughs> my position in regarding toleration. You know that the problem with the concept of toleration, I think it was Bernard Williams who, who stated it this way, the problem of toleration is that we are being asked to tolerate the intolerable. Because, you know, it's, it allows the permissio mali, you know, the yeah. <coughs> authorization of evil. Mm -hmm. And that's contradictory. Yeah. And I think maybe and, and that's, that, that's why I, I, I initially, you know, I posed the question regarding, you know, the problem is that we are moralizing political issues. And once you moralize, as you know, uh, regarding moral issues, there's only, there's only one possibility. Um, yes or no. It either is moral or it is immoral, right? So, I mean, th th there's no other way. And, and so... Um, in a certain sense, all those groups think racism is evil, so we shouldn't tolerate anything that by somehow touches upon the issues of, of racism or sexism or whatever, right? And so this, and that's the problem that, that when you've, you have to face not creeds, as was the case of the origins of toleration, which in the end were different interpretations on scripture right uh, now you know we we have to we have to pose uh, or at least they they pose the problems as being strictly moral and you're either in favor of morality or against it so there's no way you know to have a, any an opinion on a moral command yeah? so a moral command by definition commands right and so, and I think this is what makes the issue absolutely um, intractable. I mean, so I, I don't think there's an easy way out of the way that this new intolerance is uh, 
is presenting most of the on most of these questions that I, that no doubt have a, have a crucial importance for um, for a public debate, as I said before. Yeah, but um, maybe more delicate understandings are needed. There are many issues that have been that relate to tolerance and intolerance that have been put in the public agenda that are not not moral issues and should be not allowed to become moral issues. For example, the Muslim veil or whatever. There are other issues that should be moral issues. <laughs> For example, the clitorectomy of, of, of uh, young girls. No? Mm. So um, uh, probably you have to steer a way in which some moralizing is necessary and uh, the uh, fortitarian ray strong in the convictions yeah, who, 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 is who needed. Who defines the limits? You know, who defines... Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I haven't talked about the limits condition? of toleration. No? And I, 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 I mean, my line would be, and it would take a long talk, uh, my line would be that you should tolerate that uh, 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 that allows you uh, uh, to continue the process of toleration. I mean, it's, it's a transcendental, transcendental argument in Kantian terms. Uh, and, and you should not tolerate that which forbids you to tolerate, to understand difference. Uh, uh, mm, this is too abstract, and I said the problem of toleration is always contextual. No? Uh, who sets the limits? Um, well, I think there's a wide set of reasons why the veil is a non-moral issue whilst yeah. the clitorectomy is a moral issue. I mean, it. it it's done to a, 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 a little girl who uh, uh, has not made that decision herself. Uh, it's made by her community on her body, and many women in that community uh, are now resisting that type of practice. I mean, we have a clear case, I would say, hmm. for uh, uh, intervention, as we do. Yeah. Okay, as we have seen, this is an uh, incredibly interesting subject. Regretfully, we have to put a finish to it, uh, put an end to it. I'd like to thank um, the Institución Libre de Enseñanza for um, organizing this seminar, and of course, uh, Global Spain for, for their help, for the financial help in order to be capable of, of uh, implementing it. Um, to everyone who has cooperated, some of them I can see from here. Thank you very much, Javier and everyone, Elisa and all the rest. And and uh, so we hope we'll we'll see you again. As you know, as I said before, there's a web page where we'll probably be putting all the all these lectures. It's uh, um, democracy and and uh, tolerance, or tolerance and democracy. And we hope to see you soon in another webinar. Thanks very much for being with us all these weeks.